This happened to me a little over a year ago, and up until this moment, I've never told anyone about this. I'm a 21-year-old female and was 19 at the time this happened. I'm short, 5'2", and while I'm not petite, I don't look strong or intimidating in the slightest. Most people say when I'm angry, I just look like a grumpy 7th grader because of my baby face. I have a younger brother, his name is Kyle, who is about 2 years younger than me. He and I have always been polar opposites from one another. He was more popular and had a large group of friends, while I was more quiet and preferred a smaller group of close friends. Being a popular teenage boy, my brother was really into partying, drinking, smoking, that sort of thing. Nothing too crazy, mind you. That had never really been my kind of thing, but I understood the appeal and didn't mind too much. My brother can be stupid, but I don't think he'd be stupid enough to do anything that could get him into serious trouble. Regardless, it's not much of my business since my brother and I aren't particularly close. We don't fight or hate each other or anything, we just kind of coexist together, if that makes sense. We are more of acquaintances who happen to live in the same house rather than siblings. Anyways, I was visiting home from college from spring break and my parents were going to be gone over the weekend so my brother decided to throw a party at our house. Everything looked exactly how I left it so I quickly threw on my pajamas and hopped into bed making sure to lock my door so no one came wandering in here while I was trying to sleep. I fell asleep pretty quickly. Exhaustion will do that to you. But unfortunately, I'm a notoriously light sleeper, so when I heard some weird thumping, I found myself awake and annoyed. Now, how my room is laid out is that my bed is positioned horizontally along the far wall, allowing me to see my door and my small closet, which is a double door that opens outward right next to it. I lay there in my bed, my eyes looking blurrily into the darkness as the weird noise continued. I tried to listen through my drowsy state to where it was coming from. Still not moving from my bed, I scanned across my room. It was muffled, but clearly audible and seemed to emanate from the far side of the room. With a sinking feeling, I realized that the noise was coming from my closet. I could feel my heart start to pound in my chest as I stared at it through the darkness. I'm sure it's nothing. I told myself. It's been a long night. I'm tired. I'm stressed. My mind is probably just creating things that aren't really there. I looked over the door to my bedroom and saw it was locked, so there's no way anyone could have gotten in while I was sleeping. Maybe it's one of my cats, I rationalized to myself. Maybe one of them got locked in my closet or something. But I never opened my closet, and I never let my cats out of the guest room. Suddenly the thumping turned into this gross, wet, slapping sound, and I could feel my stomach knot up. I strained my eyes through the darkness and stared at the closet doors, terrified. And that's when I saw it. Through the gap of where the two doors met, peering out through blanketing darkness was an eye staring back at me. I felt my stomach heave and nearly lost my stomach right there, a scream trying to tear its way out of my throat. I didn't know what to do, and even if I did, I was paralyzed. A scared whimper began to build in my throat and I pushed it down, afraid that if I made any sound, whatever was in my closet would do something. I didn't know what. I didn't want to know. So I just laid there and stared back. The slapping sounds started to get louder and louder, soon being accompanied by the person's now audible heavy breathing, all the while I laid in bed screaming at myself to do something. It was when I heard the most disgusting moan I decided I couldn't take it anymore. I launched myself out of bed and sprinted to my closet, throwing the doors wide open. Sitting there was a guy, crouched on his knees and huddled back against my mass of stuffed animals staring back at me, a pair of my underwear in one hand, and violently having his way with the other. I can't remember much of what he looked like. It was dark and I was more focused on what else he was doing rather than his face but I know he had to be around me or my brother's age. But the look in his eyes, that I will never forget. I have never seen anything like it, and it still causes my stomach to churn to this day. The way he looked at me with those wide eyes, dilated and predatory and staring right at me, and that lecherous smile on his lips. I can't. For a moment I was paralyzed, my eyes glued to him in shock, disgust, and disbelief. Once again, I didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to scream, part of me wanted to run, and part of me wanted to fight. I guess now I know what I would do in a fight or flight situation, 
because I immediately kicked him in the crotch and began to violently stomp on him. He cried out and careened onto the floor, curling onto his side and trying to protect himself as I continued to beat him, both of us screaming and yelling at each other incoherently. Eventually, all of the yelling caught my brother's attention and he began to bang on my door. Hey, what's going on in there, Lindsay? What's happening? Open the door! Kyle screamed, banging the door and violently jigging the locked door handle. Help! Oh God, please help! The guy cried out. I kicked him in the chest hard. I could see his body curled even more in on itself as I knocked the wind out of him, but I didn't stop. In that moment, I was... it's hard to describe... I guess it's like a heat of the moment kind of thing, or tunnel vision. I couldn't really hear my brother or the guy yelling, or see the guy on the floor. All I could see was that image of him in my closet with that smile, and the sound of him in there just kept ringing in my ears and I felt so scared and angry and violated I couldn't stop. It wasn't until I heard the guy underneath me let out a legitimate sob I finally stopped. Looking down and seeing him blubbering on my carpet floor for some reason snapped me out of my violent daze, and I walked over to the door, turned on the lights and opened it. My brother immediately ran in and looked around my room, frantically asking what happened. Kyle was both drunk and out of his mind and didn't notice him at first somehow. I pointed to the floor in front of my closet and my brother's face turned white. Everything after that was a bit of a blur. My brother grabbed the guy and punched him several times before yelling at him and throwing him out of our house. Everyone had to leave after that and my brother went through every single room to make sure no one was still here. I just sat on the staircase and watched everyone leave silently. After a while my brother came over to me and sat down. There was a long, awkward silence between us. Are you okay? He asked. It was clear he felt guilty and was somewhat to blame but since we were never really close, he didn't know what to do to comfort me. Who was that? I asked him. My brother said he didn't recognize him, so he was probably just a party hopper who heard about it on social media. There was another long pause. Did he? No. I said instantly, standing up. I didn't want to talk about it. I still couldn't completely comprehend what had just happened and all I wanted to do was to ignore it. I'm sleeping in mom and dad's room tonight. Clean up everything. I paused before looking my brother straight in the eyes. Never have a party here. Again. I went upstairs and let my dog in from outside to sleep with me, and though she's no guard dog, she did make me feel safer that night. When I finally did go back into my room the next day, there was a few drops of blood on my carpet from where I kicked the guy's face. I cleaned it as best as I could. My brother and I haven't talked about it since. I never told my parents about it and he didn't either. He hasn't thrown a party when I was at the house since, thankfully. But whenever I'm home, I no longer feel safe and have to check my closet every night before I go to bed. When I was around 7 or 8 years old, I attended a private school. When the school day would end, my mom would pick my brother and I up and take us home. Normally, we would be forced to change out of our uniforms so that our mom didn't have to iron it too much for the next morning, but the moment we arrived home, it was apparent that we had visitors. My aunt from Ohio was sitting outside on our bench in the backyard with a strange man, both of them smoking. She was definitely that cool family member that all of the kids liked, but the adults rarely approved of due to her tendency to smoke, drink, be brazen, and overall act younger than her age. It turns out that she was staying with us, and that she had brought her new boyfriend to share our guest bedroom with. One particular afternoon, after maybe a week of them staying with us, my brother and I arrive home from school and of course rush to go hang out with our quirky aunt and her boyfriend, who also seemed fun. I saw them sitting on the bench again and of course ran into their laps, sitting on the boyfriend's while still in my uniform. My mom and dad joined us outside and I saw a strange look cross briefly on my mother's face. She called me over to her in a sharp tone and I remember feeling shameful but not understanding what I did wrong. Fast forward to me at the age of 20 when I was hanging out with my mom. I suddenly had a recollection of this event and prompted my mom as to why she had behaved so strangely all those years ago. 
she proceeded to tell me the entire story from her point of view. That afternoon when she walked out with my father, she had experienced a strange gut feeling about my aunt's boyfriend. Apparently she got a vibe from the way he smiled as I sat in his lap in my skirt uniform and immediately felt uncomfortable, as if his smile was not out of joy, but enjoyment in something perverse. That night, she and my father had one of the biggest arguments they have ever had, with her telling him that she didn't trust the boyfriend. My dad discarded her strange behavior as a form of hysteria. After all, the man had done nothing wrong to offend our family. She begged him to tell our guests to leave, and the next day, he told them that they had to stay elsewhere because his wife was having a fit. My aunt and her boyfriend broke it off some time later, and I knew that he was a shady guy because he had been in prison before for something minor. But what my mom said next chilled my bones. A few years after the fighting incident and my aunt and her boyfriend being removed from our home, my aunt called my mom up for a chat. During the call, my aunt confessed that she had read a headline about her ex, who had just been arrested and sent to prison for child abuse. Whether my aunt had broken off the relationship because she had known about his fantasies, I don't know. But I do know that I am grateful that my mother listened to her intuition despite the fact that no one believed her. When I was around 15, I guess you could say I was in a bad place. I had just gotten out of the hospital and was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder as well as drug-induced depressive disorder. I was completely rebelling against my parents, growing out of old friendships getting into experimentation and drugs and you know how it is. One thing I found myself absolutely fixated on though was relationships. I wanted to be in a relationship so badly. I loved the idea of having a boyfriend, someone you could tell everything to and be intimate with. My body was still developing at this time so I had the body of a pudgy lima bean and the social skills of a retarded goose. Real life guys wanted nothing to do with me. That's when, and why, I began my search for love on the internet. There was this meme page I began direct messaging, not going to say which. He had around 4k followers at the time. Things were friendly at first. We'd crack jokes, we'd send each other memes, all while being totally sarcastic and silly. It was a part of me I didn't feel like I could show in real life. He made me feel welcome. He even followed my ugly self back. So back when the send nudes meme was popular, I thought it'd be a good idea to actually send this guy nudes. I don't know what kind of logic was going through my head when I did this. To my surprise, he was into it and sent things back. I filmed myself doing things and was telling him how badly I wanted him. Things you say and do when you're a wee teen, and he went along with it. Once it was over, he told me his name, we'll call him John, his age, he was 15 and where he was from. I told him mine and where I was from. I lived in Canada, and John lived in the south of the United States, so I stupidly figured since he lived so far away there was no danger. We began messaging pretty often, maybe five times a week or more. I was developing feelings for John extremely quickly, even though I didn't know who he was. I had literally only seen naked pictures of him and the words he typed. When I realized this, I asked if he'd be down to show me his face. He was reluctant at first. He was telling me how insecure he was about himself and that he was afraid I'd find him ugly and that I'd stop talking to him if I saw what he looked like. I reassured him that that wouldn't happen and I even gave him my snapchat saying that the photo would disappear once he sent it and not to worry. He finally gave in and after we added one another on snapchat he sent me a 5 second picture of his face. He was pale, doughy, had beady eyes and a large nose with curly brown hair piled on top of his head all tied together with a nervous smile. Despite how I worded that, he wasn't completely unfortunate looking. I found it charming and endearing how insecure he was. I told him he didn't need to be nervous around me and that he was cute. He asked that I send a face back, and I did. He responded that I was gorgeous and that he was surprised I was even talking to him. I blushed and told him that this made me blush. I spent the whole night talking to him after this. I told him my backstory and he told me his. We shared secrets and insecurities and bonded over our love of smoking. The two of us got really close. We began talking every day. We face called on Snapchat and texted anytime we were free. And on one faithful day, 
He called me and asked if I would be his girlfriend. I was flattered and happily said yes. We then celebrated our new relationship by sending more nudes. For the first three days, things were great. We called and messaged each other more than ever. I even introduced him to my best friend. My friend and I had known each other since kindergarten and she was pretty much my only friend at the time. We were sitting on my bed, making awkward small talk with John, when suddenly she made me disconnect the call we were on and pulled me aside. The conversation went something like this. What are you doing? What? What do you mean? Why are you talking to this guy? You don't even know him. I, I do know him. We message each other every day. He knows almost as much about me as you do. But he's... He's so ugly. No, he's not. You're just jealous because I have a boyfriend and you don't. She scoffed at me and laughed. <laughs> do what you want. Just be careful, okay? Angry that she called my boyfriend ugly, I called John back and pretended that that conversation never happened. That night we had the deepest conversation we had ever had. He told me about how his dad was an alcoholic and how his mom was verbally abusive towards him. He told me about how his dad was moving to Utah and that he'd have no one once his dad was gone. He told me how badly he was bullied at school and how badly he wanted to die sometimes. I comforted him and told him about my sorrows and on that very call, he told me he loved me. That's finally when red flags started going off in my head. we have been dating for less than a week, three days, and he already said he loved me. He was waiting for me to respond. We were on a call. I froze. I couldn't possibly love someone so soon and without even having met them in person, yet I didn't want to reject him after he confided in me about his loneliness and sadness. So, regretfully... I told him I loved him too. This is where things took a turn. John began getting really passionate about our relationship, to the point where he was telling me how many kids he wanted, how he had told all of his friends about me and how I should fly to his state so we could meet in person and lose our virginities to one another. I wasn't a virgin at the time and thought I should be honest with him about it, so I told him. John got really upset. He started calling me terrible names and randomly accused me of going around and sleeping with guys for drugs. I tried to remain calm and explain to him that this wasn't the case. After a long and heated conversation filled with terrible shamery and insults, he relaxed and it ended up with him making me promise not to cheat on him, to which I reluctantly did. But you know, this is over text so he couldn't tell. I had taken a hiatus from schoolwork during this time to focus on my mental health. That being said, I still went to school since I wanted to be able to socialize. John and I used to text all day, even during class, but at this point I began to get a little sick of it so I told him I needed a break to try and socialize with people and that I'd be shutting off my phone. I shut it off right after having sent that and when I got home that afternoon I had over 20 messages from him frantically stating how he was going to end his own life if I left him. How he could tell I had been distant and how he had almost bought a ticket to my city to come and surprise me but that he knew I was just using him for his pics. I admit I was being completely terrible to this poor guy and I think I deserve what happened next to an extent but still it's just all messed up. At this point I was done. I didn't want him to end his own life but I also didn't want to be trapped in an exclusive online relationship with him so I decided to tell him I cheated on him. I figured that anger and resentment towards me was better than him thinking that it was his fault and potentially getting crazy over it. Long story short, bad move. He completely blew up at me. He called me terrible things, asking me why I had betrayed him. He called me a liar and everything under the sun. I made up a vague story and then told him I wouldn't be able to talk to him anymore. I blocked him and tried to go to sleep that night. I wasn't awoken around 2am by my best friend calling me. She told me in a panic that John has been harassing her over text for my personal information and that he was super angry. I told her to block him on every social media platform and she did and so did I. For the week following our breakup, John made multiple accounts direct messaging me. Some he was telling me he was sorry for getting mad and that he loved me. Some he was calling me terrible names and that he'd punch me and beat me if he ever met me. I blocked every account he made and tried to let it all blow over. Things settled down a little when I was suddenly messaged by this random girl. The conversation went something like this. 
she said. Hey, I know you don't know who I am. Just wanted to know, did you date John? I respond, yeah, kinda. How did you know? I dated him too. He was very clingy. Oh wow, small world. I just thought you should know, he's been sending me pictures of you. What pictures? Like at first it was just selfies of you, but then he started sending me like, nudes. My heart sank. I didn't know what to do. Oh my god. I think he was trying to make me jealous or something. He's crazy. I reported him. Have you blocked his account? Yeah. Do you know if he sent them to anyone else? No, sorry. Okay, well, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I deleted my Instagram account right then and there. I stayed off of Instagram for a solid year before remaking an account, and even then I never posted my full name. If you can learn anything from the story, don't send anything to strangers. People may seem friendly and warm online, but in the end, the only thing you know about them is what they've been typing to you. Again, I reiterate, don't send anything. Two years ago, I had a religious studies teacher who would always tell us crazy stories about her life. I remember one which put shivers down my spine and still shocks me to this day. Let's call my teacher Kylie. Kylie was in school when this happened to her. Every day she'd take the bus home from school, apart from the days that she'd have French classes after school, which instead she'd walk to a group of traffic lights to meet her mum. One morning, where she had French class, she told her mum she wasn't going to go for whatever reason I wasn't sure, and said she'd catch a bus home straight after school. Later on that day, Kylie was in class when a teacher came and told Kylie her mom was ringing into school and asked if she was going to French classes. Kylie didn't want the teachers to know that she was skipping the after-school activity, and so she told the teacher she was. She was confused as she remembered she told her mom that morning that she definitely wasn't going, however thought nothing more of the situation. The end of the day of school came and Kylie jumped onto the bus home. When she got home, she asked her mom why she had called in, to which her mom answered that she didn't. Are you sure? She asked, but her mom insisted that she hadn't. The only person that lived with them was Kylie's grandma, who also said she never called in. Kylie's mom spoke to the school and police and made sure Kylie never walked home alone after that instance, but... Nothing else came of the situation. She's still wondering who was pretending to be her mum, why, and what would have happened if she really did go to French Boosters and met the stranger outside of school. I'm a 25-year-old female and I grew up in the deep south of the United States, Georgia to be exact. I love it here and don't think I ever will leave. I have experienced a lot of weird things, mostly because of the nature and history of where I live, and partly because of my weird family. Here's a little background. After an ugly divorce when I was nine months old, my parents split, and my mom moved back home with her parents with me in tow. My grandparents lived in an old plantation house on 10 acres in the middle of nowhere. That has been in our family since the late 1800s. My grandmother grew up there, her father before her, and so on. The house is enormous, and there are large implications about its history, but I will point out that it was taken over by my family in the late 1800s, post-Civil War. I didn't know much about the history of the house before my family took it over while it was growing up, but I did hear family stories about my great-grandfather bootlegging with the grandfather of our town's now sheriff and profiting greatly from it. There were also rumors of my great-grandfather shooting partners of his moonshining endeavors on the property and my great-great-grandfather beating a man to death for sleeping with his wife in their bed. But that's about it. None of those things happened in the house. So I grew up in that house, and even when my mom got remarried, I opted to live with my grandparents. It was easier for everyone. No bitterness, just easy. My mom is wonderful and was still an enormous part of my life as she and my stepfather bought the adjacent property to my grandparents. This story happened when I was 20. 
I was staying home while my grandparents, mother, and her husband, uncle, and sister drove to Maryland for a week for my cousin's graduation from college. I was going to a university in the next town over, and it was finals week so I couldn't go. I had my ex fiance stay with me since the house was so big and I only had one final that I actually needed to go to campus for, so I'd be pretty lonely. He was also going to help me with the dogs. My grandfather is an honest-to-God farm boy who believes blue tick hounds are the only breed worth its salt, so of course we have two, Reba, named after Reba McIntyre, and Roscoe, named for Roscoe P. Coltrane of the Dukes of Hazard. These dogs are purebred and all muscle. I also have a 150-pound razor's edge blue pit named Butch. The dogs paired with the arsenal of guns, my grandfather has left no need for a security system. My friends even now swear they get a creepy vibe from the house. I never had before this, but the house has a reputation for being creepy. Rumors about lynchings, satanic rituals, clan meetings, all before my family bought it way back in the Civil War times. I never paid much attention because I knew it was all nonsense. Southern towns love to gossip and that's what I thought it was. A couple of days after my grandparents left, my boyfriend and I were outside in the backyard, about to smoke, and while we were twisting up, I happened to look up at the house, and the light in my grandparents' room was on. I hadn't turned it on, or even been in there, and my ex was very respectful, so I knew it wasn't him. To avoid being paranoid, I called the dogs behind me and went inside to check everything out. I got upstairs and looked around my grandparents' room. The hounds wouldn't go in, which... I didn't think was odd at the time, which I should have, because they slept in there. Butch stayed glued to me with his hackles raised. I didn't find anything, flipped off the lights, and went back out to smoke. The rest of the night went normal, and me and my ex went to bed. I made sure all the lights were off before I went. The hounds wanted to sleep in my room at the foot of the bed, which I thought was because we were the only ones in the house, and Butch stayed right up on me in the bed, which I thought was because the hounds were in the room. Butch is very possessive of me. Around one-ish in the morning, I woke up. It was one of those out of a dead sleep, cold sweat kind of deals. I had never experienced it before. I sat up and looked at the door across the room. It was open. I knew I had closed it before I went to bed. The dogs were also standing at the foot of the bed staring out of it. I assumed that Roscoe had gotten down and that was what woke me up. My ex had gone to the bathroom and left the door open. I shook him awake to ask. He said he'd been asleep the whole time and rolled back over. I noticed while laying back down that there was a light on down the hall. I also noticed that the dogs were still staring at the door. I was so sure that there was someone in the house. I got up and grabbed the 12 gauge that my grandpa made me keep in my room from under the bed and called the dogs to follow me out of the room. It was my grandparents' room again. I searched the whole house. All six bedrooms, four bathrooms, attic, downstairs, all of it. Nothing. I grabbed my cigarettes and phone and went to the back porch to let the dogs out. I smoked a cigarette and went back to bed. I called my grandpa the next day, thinking there may just be an electrical short in the wiring or something. I told my grandpa what had happened, and he told me there was not a short and wanted me to talk to my uncle. When my uncle came on the phone, he told me a story that happened when he was growing up. Apparently he had come home one night in high school and the house was empty. He went upstairs to his room and when he turned the corner from the stairs, he saw a man in a black suit at the end of the hall in front of my grandparents' bedroom door. He didn't stick around to see what happened next. He noped it downstairs and out the door to his girlfriend's house. He told me he hadn't seen anything since and that if I left it alone, it would leave me alone. I thought he was messing with me. I talked back to my grandpa who said he believed my uncle and that he had seen the doors open and close by themselves and footsteps in the hall. I flipped out. I kept the dogs with me wherever I was. Nothing else happened until they got back. I asked my grandma if anything weird had happened before the family had bought the house. She said she didn't know and changed the subject. So I went to the library. This is what I found out from the librarian, who also happened to be a local historian with evidence to back it up. Apparently in 1859, the man who built the house had a son who had become a minister and was the pastor of a local church. He had gotten a local girl pregnant and when the baby was born, he killed it to atone for his sin. When the mother of the baby tried to stop him, 
He beat her pretty badly. The brother of this poor girl said he wanted to speak with the minister and was shown upstairs to his study, which was, you guessed it, my grandparents' bedroom. The conversation heated up and ended with the brother of the girl beating the minister senseless and pushing him out of the window. The brother was hung, and that's where the rumors of satanic rituals came into play. The rumor is, is that the baby was killed as a sacrifice to the devil to keep the minister in power at the church because he was dipping into the offering plate on Sundays, and the mother interfered and the baby died before the minister could finish the ritual. I don't believe the rumors, but there is solid evidence that the minister killed the baby and was then killed by the brother of the mother. So I saged the crap out of that house, against my grandmother's wishes, and anointed all the doorways with oil. There hasn't been another incident, but in my grandparents' will the house is being left to me. My aunts and uncles all have their own houses, and I love the house. My grandparents really want to keep it in the family. So... Wish me luck. I lived in Bellevue, Washington, which is easily one of the wealthiest cities in the Pacific Northwest. I am originally from Helena, Montana, so I grew up like a normal kid and then my mother got a job for Amazon in downtown Seattle, so we moved to Bellevue. You can barely find a decent house here for under a million dollars. Now, I'm not trying to brag, but I want to set the stage for my story. We live in a nice neighborhood and have no problems with crime whatsoever. I also live on a hill which has a view of downtown Bellevue, so our living room and kitchen areas open up to a huge back deck with a view of downtown's glittering skyscrapers. I was 17 years old at the time of this story, about to graduate high school. I was out with friends cruising around the city and around 1am, I decided I was tired and wanted to go home. A girl I had been flirting with said she didn't have a curfew and asked if she would come hang out at my house. I agreed and my friends dropped us off at her place. She and I drove to my house so she could have a way to get home when it was about time for her to leave. When we arrived, I pulled out my phone and disarmed the security system so we could get in without tripping the alarm and awaking the entire street. Once inside, we watched a couple episodes of Friends in the media room downstairs so my parents couldn't hear us, as I surely wasn't allowed to bring girls over this late at night. I remember getting a notification on my phone from our security system app that read, Looks like someone left the sliding glass door open for 10 minutes. It basically does that so you remember to close it. I didn't think much of it and thought maybe my mom left it open before she went to bed hours earlier. I hadn't yet made the connection that the door had been opened 10 minutes ago, neither me nor my sleeping parents could have done it. Fast forward an hour and I was pretty beat. Me and the girl that was over had missed the last episode because we had been kissing, and then she asked if we could go outside and get some air. I agreed, and then we went out to my deck and laid on a deck chair together, enjoying the cool spring air. I left the sliding door open to the air out of the house and then my phone buzzed again, saying that I had left it open. I then remembered the notification I had gotten earlier and got a weird feeling. I wondered how I'd even been open in the first place so late at night. I brushed the feeling off because this girl was practically throwing herself at me. And needless to say, about 15 minutes later we moved things into my bedroom. I promise this isn't a smut story and this is where it gets truly terrifying. We were on my bed when I suddenly heard movement come from what I thought was outside my bedroom door. I assumed it was one of my parents and quickly rushed the girl under my bed. I waited for a second and then she came back up. A few minutes later I heard the noises again but I distinctly knew that it came from inside my closet. I sat bolt upright and was now scared. The girl asked what was wrong and I hushed her my ears pounding, looking for another noise. What happened next still gives me nightmares. We sat on my bed and watched in horror as my closet door slowly creaked open, revealing the silhouette of a massive man standing there, watching us. We were both paralyzed with fear and disbelief and sat there barely breathing. The silence was deafening. The man moved his hand and we heard it brush into his pockets. He pulled out a lighter and flicked it on lighting up his face and a long knife in the darkness. He was grinning. The girl I was with screamed so loudly that I felt as if though my ears were about to bleed. 
We both sprinted out of the room and out into the front yard. The girl ran in track and was much faster than me because I only played tennis and golf. She pulled ahead and I turned back to see if he was running after us. He wasn't, and then my fear instantly turned towards my parents, asleep in their beds. I stopped on the road and decided if I should run back or try to have a neighbor call for help. I decided to run back and as I neared my house, I heard a gunshot ring out. By now I was starting to cry for fear my parents of being hurt. I heard my mother screaming out a name and I ran back to our yard to see her out there calling the police. I collapsed into her arms and sobbed. I was so completely terrified that I couldn't even think. My mom explained to me that my dad was fine and that he shot the man when he went into their room. The police and paramedics arrived in about five minutes and my parents and I sat out in the yard together and gave up reports of the story. I didn't even care that my parents knew I had a girl over at that point. As I finished, they wheeled out the man on a stretcher. He screamed profane things at us, saying he wanted to end our lives and bathe in our blood. Eventually the girl came back to fetch her car, gave her report, and went home as the sun started to rise. People in nearby houses had wandered out and been watching for a while. My dad told me a few days later that he had seen the man many times before. My dad had recently quit his job and been hanging around the house lately. He said the man had come to the door many times trying to sell things, but never went to any other houses. And when he was at the door, he would try to peer in and see what was inside. What haunts me the most is that nothing inside our house was touched, which means that he came into our house with the one intention, to harm my family and I. To this day, my parents have been searching for a new house and I had moved out for college in the Bay Area. I haven't talked to the girl since around the time of this story and it was only to apologize to her. Now I always lock my doors and keep the closet door wide open. I also keep a fan on at night as the silence still terrifies me. I have a bunch of stories from my childhood as well as my parents' lives preceding my birth. You guys can believe what you will, but everything I share here has actually happened to either me or my family members. I'm a female in my late 20s. My parents, a charming lesbian couple, own a funeral home and a cemetery in a village on the outskirts of the Alaskan tundra. It was a small business that had been passed down from my mother, Agatha's father, who inherited it from his father and so on. Katie, my other mother, was terrified of the whole situation from the beginning. She was positive that someone would get possessed with us living so close to a field of corpses, in her words. Over time, exactly eight years after they moved there, she grew to respect the land as well as the tenants resting in peace there. I was born shortly after her change of heart, but she still limited my access to the cemetery. And while no one was ever possessed, we still had our fair share of terrifying experiences at our home and throughout the property. I went to a tiny schoolhouse every weekday from the time I could walk. Only 30 or so children lived in our town, so we were all educated in one room by a small group of teachers. Katie and her twin sister Gloria were two of these teachers. The three of us would walk to and from town every day, while Aga and her brother Cal took care of the property. It was a 20-minute trek, but on the occasional day without freezes, we got to take our bikes and that was generally the highlight of my life. However, on this particular day in December, we had to walk. We were only at the school until about 4 o'clock that afternoon, but the sun usually set at around 3.30, so we were shrouded mostly in darkness by the time we got to the dirt road leading up to our property. I was about 6 or 7 at the time and I still use my clumsiness as an excuse not to walk up the path, muddied by snow. Gloria had drawn the short straw and was giving me a piggyback ride up the hill. I was resting my head against her back and staring at the cemetery that was beginning to come into view around the paper birches and spruce trees. It was a sprawling field filled with an odd assortment of mausoleums, colorful tombs of Inuit and the Russian Orthodox citizens. I was always entranced by the graves and tried to pick out ones that I had yet to see. We were nearly to the house when I saw a figure standing in the far right corner of the cemetery. It was hard to discern their age or gender, 
but I could tell from the build that it wasn't Aga or Cal. Visiting hours ended at sundown, regardless of the date, so I immediately pointed the person out to Katie. Now, most of the finer details are recalled by my parents and other family members due to my young age throughout most of these events, but I can still clearly remember hearing Katie mutter, Oh my god, quietly under her breath. She helped me off of Glory's back and ordered that I go inside to tell Cal to meet them in the field. Without hesitation, I suddenly found myself as sure-footed as a bunny on the icy ground and sprinted the last twenty or so yards up to the house. I swung the door open and went into the kitchen where I knew I'd find Aga and Cal and told my uncle to get the trespasser. Groaning, Cal finished his cup of coffee, which was probably spiked with whiskey, and stood from the table. Angit Cal was a big guy, maybe about six foot eight with broad shoulders and what I called Fred Flintstone fists. Basically, he could knock someone out without much effort, and he did so time and time again. He was insanely protective of sisters and all of the other women in his life, Lori and Katie included. The entire town respected him and feared him at the same time. He was a nice at-home security system. Naturally, I was thrilled with this tiny bit of excitement in my normally humdrum life. When my uncle charged out the back without so much as a coat on, I turned my pleading eyes to Aga, who barely flinched at the activity. She stared back at me for only a moment before sighing and motioning to the rack by the door. I grabbed her parka and helped her put it on as we made our way outside. Knowing that her wife was going to be not too thrilled with my presence at the cemetery, Aga picked me up when we reached the cast iron fence that surrounded the property. We could see Cal's giant silhouettes approaching the tiny ones of Katie and Glory. The stranger was still a good 100 or so yards from all of us. Let's hide and watch, I whispered to Aga when I realized that Katie hadn't spotted us yet. For a moment I thought my mother would shake her head and go to the others, but she surprised me by giving me a conspiring smile and ducking behind a mausoleum. We can get to Grandma's grave if we are very quiet, she told me with a glint in her eye. She loved the graveyard and had spent her whole childhood playing in it while also learning about her ancestors and the people of her town. She wanted me to enjoy it as much as she did. We heard from grave to grave, pausing only long enough to make sure that the others didn't see us. Katie, Glory, and Cal were moving swiftly as well, but they were too busy eyeing the figure, standing only about twenty feet from the large tomb that encased my great-grandmother, our destination. When we arrived at the tomb... Aga set me down and we crouched behind the rocks and wood that surrounded Grandmother's altar. It was then that I began to feel nerves eat away at my gut. This was a stranger, I could tell. They were standing at the base of the mausoleum, built to honor the infants who had passed before being blessed by the tribe shaman. This was an old, outdated site that didn't fully honor Inuit customs though and had been redone in the 1970s, closer to the northern section of the property. No one came to the site because it would be considered disrespectful to their deceased, but it would have been just as disrespectful to tear it down, so it was just a derelict memorial that loomed on the tiny hilltop of that section of the cemetery. Tension filled the air as Cal, flanked by Katie and Glory, approached the stranger. I could hear my uncle speaking to them, likely telling them our hours and asking if they'd like a ride back into town. He always started off nice giving people the benefit of the doubt before going into Hulk mode. Aga, who had initially been giggling at the sight of her brother looming over the trespasser, was beginning to cling tighter to me as time went on. It took us a few minutes to realize that the person hadn't been responding to Cal, nor had they even looked his way. They just continued to stare at the area just above the mausoleum. Katie and Gloria were exchanging uneasy glances and at one point, Cal told them to go back to the house. They refused and stepped closer to his side. When words failed, Cal resorted to the physical approach. He later recalled that he could tell the person an old man was frail and that he didn't want to hurt him, but he wasn't listening and if he was deaf, he'd have to get his attention somehow. My uncle placed a gentle hand on the gentleman's shoulder and immediately he felt a wave of nausea overcome him. He hunched over, clutching his abdomen, cried out, Aga ordered me to stay put before darting out from behind the stones and over to her brother who waved her and the other women off. He insisted that they go inside, 
but they were all frozen in place. The strange man still hadn't moved, so Katie yelled at him once more. She stepped around in front of him and waved a hand in his face. You'll need to leave, I heard her command. You can't be here after dark, it's not safe. No, it's not, the stranger finally said. He lowered his eyes to smile at my mother. Are you alright, dear? He spoke so casually to her that she stood there in shock for a good few moments. She looked back at Cal, who was on his knees at this point. While she was distracted, the man turned and headed towards the exit. When he was coming towards my hiding spot, I had every intention of getting up and running away, but I was frozen in place. It felt like my body was being held down by weights and I was sinking into the earth. I whimpered and buried my face in my arms, praying to God and my great-grandmother for safety. The ice and leaves crunched in my ears and I knew Aga realized my predicament and said something to the others because I could hear Katie shouting at her. Finally summoning the courage, I looked up to see the man walking right by me. He didn't so much as look my way, but as he passed, he said, Good night, blue eyes, in a dulcet whisper. Immediately, I relaxed and climbed to my feet. I watched him practically float out of the cemetery and towards the road. Katie came and got me, telling me that he had to take my uncle to the hospital. As it turns out, Cow had to go in for emergency surgery because his appendix ruptured. He's convinced that the old man somehow cursed him on contact. Even Aga, sweet but superstitious Aga, had her doubts about his claims. There was nothing malicious in Cow's approach to the man, so why would he have cursed him? This wasn't the last time we saw the strange man. We actually saw him two or three more times in the following weeks. He was always at the derelict infant mausoleum, staring up at the sky. He never spoke or bothered anybody, and from that point on, he always came while it was light out. I would sometimes sneak out and watch him from grandmother's grave. He was a white man, which struck a chord with me. It was my theory that he was Katie and Gloria's real father, who had abandoned them when they were still very young. Katie quickly disproved this theory, telling me that her father died in the early 90s, but that meant nothing to me. It could still be him. The last time I saw him was in early February the following year. It was snowing heavily and I was helping Aga and Cal go about and check to see if all the tombs and mausoleums were closed. Sometimes family members of the deceased would perform rituals of their newly departed, placing ceremonial offerings on their bodies, but they wouldn't always restore their tombs to the way they were. We did our best to ensure that none of the graves would be flooded come next thaw. When we approached Grandmother's grave, I heard Aga sigh airily but continue on. Immediately, I looked to the old mausoleum and smiled at the back of the old man. Good morning, I called out to him. There's no such thing, blue eyes. I heard him respond over the wind. I began to laugh because it sounded like something Gloria would say after a night of drinking, but suddenly I felt a ball of sadness coil up in my stomach. I began crying and looked up at Aga with a sorrowful pout. It was the first time I had ever really felt dread, and it nearly brought me to my knees. Aga picked me up and took me inside where I instantly felt better. The man was never seen on the property again. I was a little sad about it, but the adults were all glad. They didn't like the pull that he had on us. I'm from Singapore where healthy males are required to serve at least two years in the military. I was just out of basic military training and was training to become a signaler. In one of the training exercises, we had to lay lines for our field telephones. How we did it was that wires would be released from a slow-moving Land Rover. I was assigned to the inevitable task of following the rover on foot whilst making sure that the wires were off the dirt path. I hadn't slept a wink for three days straight by then and had lagged so far behind the rover that it was out of sight. After a while, I came to a peculiar stretch of road that had uniformly tall vegetation on each side of it that obscured what was then a full moon. I was quite some ways into the path when I noticed a white piece of paper on the ground. On closer inspection, I realized it was a piece of paper money that we Chinese would burn to appease the dead. 
Finding this here was very strange as civilians were strictly not allowed in this area and the nearest civilian housing was several kilometers away. I have heard of rights being held for servicemen who tragically perished during military exercises though, which honestly made me feel worse. Then, the creepiest thing happened when the paper started to move slowly towards me. I stepped aside to avoid it, but it corrected its course at me. I took out my torch just to make sure that it wasn't a small animal tugging it, but the light from my torch was so dim as if I had a flat battery. It was at that moment that my tiredness immediately dissipated and my adrenaline kicked in as I ran for the rover ahead of me, not daring to look back. I was so relieved when I saw the rear lights of the rover and climbed on, panting heavily. I came up with the excuse to my section mates that I needed a break. They were too tired themselves to probe any further. I looked at the torch that was still in my hands and turned it on again. It was as bright as it ever could be. I have been in a long distance relationship with my girlfriend for a couple of years, and every summer and winter break I am able to travel to go see her. This encounter happened about two years ago at my girlfriend's house. I should mention that my girlfriend lives on the outskirts of her city in Mexico, where houses are around two to three hundred yards apart and surrounded by dense woods. Usually, days and nights there go about peacefully, accompanied by the sounds of the woods and the occasional car passing by from others who live nearby. I had always considered her place to be perfect to spend time outdoors, until this occasion. Honestly, I don't think I had ever been this scared in my life. This sighting will be carved into my mind forever. On a chilly night in December, I was at my girlfriend's house. I had planned to spend the night with her since she would have been by herself all that day. Her mom was out of town and she didn't want her to stay by herself either. We were having dinner in the kitchen at around 8pm. We chatted about activities we would do tomorrow, tasks her mom asked us to do, and how much we missed each other, among others. After about an hour of conversation and laughs, we decided to go into the living room and cuddle on the couch, watching TV. We both got up and put the dishes in the sink. She went into her bedroom, and I went outside to the bathroom. The house layout consisted of a long corridor that connected pretty much every room in the house, and a back door at the end of the corridor which led to the patio. The patio was open, full of trees, plants, and the only thing separating the patio from the woods was a fence made up of stones and barbed wire that stood at around one meter tall. Halfway down the patio, there was the bathroom, being lit by a single and weak light bulb, so if anybody wanted to go, they had to walk outside, even if it had to be in the middle of the night. I'm not coming here at night, I thought. I remember when I opened the back door and stepped into the patio, a cold breeze stroked my face and sent shivers across my back, so I heard to go back as quickly as possible because, to be honest, I was a little spooked going outside in the darkness knowing that the woods were pretty much a few steps away. I finished doing my business, washed my hands and started walking back, being careful not to trip on something because the light bulb was almost non-existent. I was about halfway when I heard a noise to my left, like someone stepping on a branch and breaking it. I stopped and quickly turned, trying to see what made the noise, but I could only see a portion of the fence and nothing but darkness beyond that. However, I had this weird feeling that someone or something was watching me, something on the other side of the fence. I stood there in silence for around 30 seconds listening to the surroundings only to notice the crickets had stopped chirping. I got a bit freaked out because I knew for sure they were chirping when I first got out. I was somewhat scared to move but I did anyway, almost running to get inside as soon as possible. When I returned, I went to my girlfriend who was already in the living room, laying down on the couch with a blanket on top. She noticed I was a bit agitated and asked me what was wrong. Your patio is pretty scary, I jokingly said not wanting to tell her what I felt because she hates anything that has to do with horror or scary stuff. I decided to brush it off, so I went around the couch and sat at the other end of it, putting my girlfriend's legs on my lap and asking what she was watching on TV. I turned to my right and noticed that there was a huge window on one side of the wall that gave me a perfect view of the patio. I didn't see it before because it was next to a cabinet being covered on the way into the living room. Now that I knew about it, 
I kept turning to see outside, still thinking how scary it looked. As we were watching a boring documentary, I took off my girlfriend's socks and started to rub her feet below the blanket. After all, it was a chilly night and her feet were cold. We didn't have a conversation, I was getting sleepy, but after around 20 minutes I started hearing noises outside, noises that seemed to be coming from the patio. I grabbed the controller and muted the TV to make sure I was hearing right, and I was. It sounded like tiny twigs breaking and grass being brushed. I quickly turned to my right to see outside the window, but I could only see the plants and part of the trunk from a big tree. The noise, although faint, stopped for a few seconds and resumed a few moments later and stopped again. I stood frozen, watching outside the window, almost as if waiting for a thing to appear. What is that noise? I whispered to my girlfriend. But after I didn't get a reply, I turned around and stood up a little to see she had her eyes closed and had fallen asleep. I was a bit freaked out, but I chose to believe it was probably a coyote or some other animal that looks around the woods at night. I kept watching the TV, muted, waiting for the noise to start again. But after a while, I realized that it had stopped. I turned around one more time to see outside the window, and I felt my heart sink into my stomach. The first thing I noticed when I looked outside that time was a faint image of a gray, pale, and tall humanoid figure peeking from the side of the big tree trunk staring right back at me. I suddenly froze in fear, not wanting to even slightly move or breathe. I watched this thing as it watched me, even though I couldn't see its eyes because of the poor lighting, but I knew it was watching me. I knew it was aware of me. I somehow felt it. The creature was, like I said, pale, really pale. I could see the contrast between its skin and the bark of the tree. The creature was very thin, had skinny shoulders and torso, as well as an elongated neck. It looked like it was around six or seven feet tall. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, I could not distinguish in detail any facial features because of how dark it was but I could perfectly picture in my head the shadowy areas around where the eyes would be for a person and another one where the mouth would be. It was sort of grinning. At this point, I was trembling a little, and I wanted my girlfriend to know what I was witnessing, but I didn't want to move a muscle or break eye contact with that thing. I felt like I needed to remain still or play dead to lose its attention. But no, the creature kept staring at me, not moving an inch like it was trying to do the same. Then, to turn things worse, the creature started to make echoey clicking sounds, kind of like a frog but slower, and I noticed it began to turn its head to its left side and turn back to look at me really fast. I didn't know what to think anymore. All I wanted was my girlfriend to wake up to prove to me that this thing was real. I began whispering her name in between my teeth and mouth, not even wanting to move my jaw but she wouldn't wake up, and the thing kept doing the same, turning its head to the left and back to me really fast. The creature crouched kind of like when big predator cats are hunting and lay low, preparing to attack. Oh my god, I whispered. I know, stupid. I didn't even think of the fact that if I woke my girlfriend up, she would start moving and that the thing would notice both of us, but I was too scared that I kept trying. This went around for maybe less than 15 minutes before I realized I still had my girlfriend's foot in my hand below the blanket, so the thing would not be able to see me moving, only using my wrist. I slightly pulled her foot back and forth, whispering her name again and again, but no response. Then, I stood in shock when I saw the creature stand up again and started walking backwards, still looking at me and disappearing into the darkness of the patio doing the clicking sounds again. I passed saliva and blinked a few times, realizing my eyes itched from staring at the creature the whole time. For some reason I couldn't turn my head around, I kept looking in the direction where the creature disappeared, listening for sounds and waiting for it to appear once again. A few minutes passed and I took the chance to turn around. Slowly, as if in slow motion, I turned my head to my girlfriend and started calling her name louder whilst pushing her leg and quickly scribbling my fingers on the sole of her foot to wake her up fast. Her foot jerked and she started turning. I stood up to her shoulders and patted her, whispering, Hey, wake up, baby. 
She opened her eyes and squinted at me, adjusting to the TV and wondering why I woke her up. I kept telling her to remain still and silent when I heard the sound again. She looked at me, noticed the concern in my eyes and asked, What's wrong? Shh, be quiet. I followed, putting two fingers on her lips and looking into her eyes. I could see she was getting freaked out and I don't blame her. I would be too if someone woke me up, looking scared and telling me to be quiet. The clicking sound went off again, but it was louder this time, almost as if that thing was on the other side of the window. This time, both of us heard the noise, and we stood looking at each other in silence, getting more and more scared. What is that? My girlfriend asked, but I remained quiet. Again, in slow motion, I started to turn my head toward the window to check, and there it was. The thing was right outside the window, only a couple of feet away and staring right back at me. This time I had clearer vision of how it looked. I was wrong. I was petrified in fear when I noticed it didn't have a mouth where a person would have had one. Instead, the mouth was on its neck, which opened horizontally, not vertically. As its mouth opened, it vibrated with the clicking sounds and hundreds of small razor-like teeth shined with the window glare. It had oval-shaped eyes that were as dark as the night. I felt its gaze pierce through my soul. I started shaking and breathing faster, not believing what I was seeing. My girlfriend peeked by my side to see what I was looking at, and I instantly felt her body tense up under me as she started to ask me in a trembling voice what that thing was, but no answer came out of me. Now we were both scared to even move a muscle. After the humanoid noticed my girlfriend move, it gave a step forward and lowered its head, almost as if though it was scanning us. We jumped in fear after seeing the thing doing it because we thought it was starting to come towards us. My heart was beating so fast I thought I would faint any time. Then, the thing began to walk slowly to its right side, in the direction where the door was to the corridor, resuming the clicking sounds. If you have seen the movie Signs and remember the scene where the humanoid came out of the bushes outside of the house, that would be an accurate representation of what we saw. We took a good look at every inch of that thing's body. It walked with its head turned towards us. After we lost sight of it through the window, we both sat up and looked at each other when suddenly we heard something scratch the metal door that led to the corridor as if the thing was grazing its finger on it. Without thinking twice, I grabbed my girlfriend's wrist and jolted out of the living room, locking ourselves in her bedroom. We sat on the floor right next to the bedroom, hiding in case that thing got inside. The scratching sounds continued and my girlfriend started to sob, still asking what we saw. I felt powerless knowing I couldn't do much to reassure her. I could only hold her and hope for the thing to give up and leave. The noise continued for about three minutes when it suddenly stopped. Then we began hearing stepping noises all around the house and we kept turning to see whatever direction we heard the noise come from. Eventually the noises ceased and after an hour or so, we figured the creature had left. My girlfriend, still with tears in her eyes, told me we could lay in bed. I agreed because my back was hurting from being in that crouched position for over an hour. We slowly crawled into bed, making the least noise possible and covering ourselves with another blanket. Don't worry baby, everything's going to be okay tomorrow. Just try and get some sleep. I told her as I tightened my grip on her. She didn't reply, but... After a while, she fell asleep again. I didn't get a minute of sleep that night. I kept my eyes opened, listening to every sound around us. The next day, we didn't even want to touch the subject. All we said was that the creature was not from this world. My girlfriend said she felt the creature's gaze pierce into her, almost as if that thing was feeling with its pure sight. Nothing else was said. We were left sort of traumatized. I realized she was going to have to put up with that fear of going outside in the future and I didn't want that thing anywhere near her again or her family. Days after the encounter we both suffered from nightmares. She mentioned that sometimes she would wake up in the middle of the night screaming and trembling and wouldn't be able to stop until her mom went to check on her. The fences that separated the patio and the windows had been redone since. They now stand at two meters tall blocking any easy access from the woods. Before this, they had to make sure they didn't have to go outside at night. 
they haven't had any other encounters again, but my girlfriend insists that the patio still gives her chills at night. This incident happened back in 2014 when I was last committed to a psych ward. A little background, I am female and was 19 at the time. I was coming off of three years of bipolar medication while at a peak of substance abuse facilitated by my first year in college going crazy with newfound adult freedom. One night I had a big mental episode and was committed for the first time in the adult ward. Previously I had only been admitted in the minors ward during my adolescence for similar episodes. Within this unit, you had to share a room with the same sex but weren't given any proper introductions. The facility as a whole wasn't managed effectively, nor did any of the nurses or doctors seem to care other than to prescribe and get you out. I was led to the room I was staying in, and the nurse just said to the other lady in the room, This is your new roommate, and left. The woman appeared to be in her late 40s, early 50s, Hispanic, and just a little taller than me. She would not keep her gaze off of the floor in front of her and didn't say a word or move when I said hi. I noticed she had a tattoo of a cartoon version of the classic Red Devil, but as a baby. I figured I'd just leave her alone and stick to my area of the room. The first night went as normally in a psych ward with a nightly group and my roommate declined to share anything, yet again only staring at the floor barely moving an inch. While everyone was lining up to be given their medication before bed, the ward across began to start banging on the glass of the door and screaming. One guy was smiling while banging his bald head against the glass window part while the guys behind him were screaming and jumping around. It seemed as if though they were almost going to break through, but orderlies came and took them away with their screams still lingering through the halls. Being in a psych ward before, I wasn't surprised by out-of-the-ordinary behavior like yelling or fight starting, but this was completely different to me. I was with disturbed adults, now people who had years of illness deteriorating their mind, not little angry kids anymore. I actually felt scared for the first time because of the high level of unpredictability with these people. I knew I wasn't all there in the head, but even these people had me anxious and made it difficult to try to get any rest that night. You know that feeling of being awake, but you haven't opened your eyes yet? The moment when you are barely waking up and everything is kind of fuzzy. This is the state of consciousness I was in later that night. I felt like I was waking up, but as if something was waking me up, yet still tired so I wasn't opening my eyes. The more I came to, I felt pressure on my forehead, and I could sense sweat dripping on my face. I opened my eyes to find the roommate standing over my bed, staring me in the eye with one hand on my forehead, and the other in a balled up fist on her chest while she speaks in what I assume is tongues. I look into her eyes, and they are blank and empty of any emotion. She keeps speaking faster and getting louder. I am paralyzed at this moment and not sure what to do, or what she would even do if I were to yell or move. It was only us in the room, and the nurse's station is all the way at the end of the hall. She started wiping the sweat off my forehead while still speaking fast and erratic, and I wasn't sure what she was going to do or planned on doing next. She then put both hands on my forehead and at this point was screaming while shaking me but not long before a nurse came in and took her off of me. The nurse seemed more irritated that she had to get up and do her job rather than concerned about how I was doing or feeling. She escorted the woman out and said to not worry and just go back to sleep. I don't know how but I managed to fall back asleep. I assume she got transferred to the more severe ward because I did not see her again the next day and, luckily, I was able to leave later that day. This incident has since been a reminder for me never to go back and to manage my mental well-being because, while I have issues, I could be in a far worse state of mind. I still wake up nights with lingering anxiety and have to calm myself down to go back to sleep. I never want to go back to a ward in my life to experience this again, or something far worse. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit. 
our Let's Read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel and grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.